All right, we are recording. Great. All right, welcome to the. Uh, I'm Don McWilliams. I'm the chair for tonight. Welcome to our ISCO Environmental Board meeting tonight. Um, due to the virtual format of our meetings, here's some quick guidelines. So, we'll could our participants online and others in the room please speak clearly and pause frequently? Um, state your name each time before speaking and mute your microphone when you're not speaking. If you have any technical issues, you can try logging in on a different device or raise your hand and let us know and we'll try to figure it out. Commissioners uh, in the room, if you desire to speak, sign normal, please put your little sign up. Um, we'll, we'll call on you as we go around. Any commissioners on the virtual side, if you could just raise your hand, we'll be watching for you. And then we'll be summarizing our, our topics at the end of each topic, if there is uh, a summary to, to go through. Um, some of our stuff tonight is informational, and then our last one is, uh, last two actually, we're looking for some feedback on. Stacy, with that, want to take us through attendance? Great. Uh, Tom Anderson. Here. Uh, Nancy Davidson has an excused absence. Jamie Finch has an excused absence. And Taraj Gopandi has an excused absence. Joy Lewis. Here. Uh, Ashwin Khan. Here. Uh, Ashwin Manaharan, Don McWilliams, here. Uh, Ann Newcomb, here. Janet Wall, here. Dixie Bear, here. And Alex Lee Tigner, here. Um, we have quorum. We have three members missing, so our three alternates will be sitting in as regular members. Okay. Okay, next steps approval of minutes. Is there any comments on the previous minutes and changes that you would like to see? Hearing none, I think we can call those approved. And moving on to public comments. I see we have Connie on the line. Is there anybody else? Stacy? Um, we do have a couple other members um, that may be with our consultant team. Um, so I'm not sure uh, if you are a member of the public and want to either raise your hand or send a note in the chat, um, please do so if you'd like to make public comment. Um, in addition to Connie, who would like to make verbal comments, we had written comments submitted by Connie, um, Ann Fletcher, and Steve Perret. I just wanted to like for the environmental board, those were sent out to the board members. But I believe Connie at this time is the only one that wants to make verbal comments. Okay. Bonnie, the floor is yours. Unmute her, Stacey. Should be able to unmute herself. One second, Connie, you're muted. Honey, you should be able to unmute yourself. I don't, it doesn't look like I'm able to unmute you. How about now? Yes. yes. I will tell you what it does on this end, just so you know. It periodically flashes a screen, giving you a three key task to unmute yourself. There is no unmute yourself thing other than that. So. That's why it took me so long. So now you know when people look confused, that may be what happened. Okay. Um, so I sent you a grumpy email and then a more thoughtful email. Um, so I am going to start with the difficulty of comprehensive plan consolidation and updating. So without knowing where you are, like what the current comprehensive plan policies are in some sort of a matrix, it's really hard to understand what you have attempted and whether it's working or not. So I know for me, having that matrix and then the successfulness or how we far we have gotten in those 
comprehensive plan concepts then can lead to a thoughtful discussion of what the story of the future should be. Now, it doesn't matter so much what element it ends up in. What matters is we're trying to use the comprehensive plan to figure out what is going to work for 30 years. And I don't find what has been provided um, leads to a discussion of the story of the future of Issaquah at the 30,000 foot level. All it does for my particular brain is, is uh, it makes me look at the definitions of words and I don't understand the definitions of the words that you're asking us to talk about. And, and so I'm not going to be able to help or understand. And I don't know if the boards and commissions can either. Now, skipping on to that very broad, I don't get it sort of, and I'm sorry, this is my third and a half comprehensive plan update. So it's not my first comp plan update. So it's not that I know nothing. It's just I don't get this process. So then moving on to the, um, what's it called? The spreadsheet for how we're supposed to be judging what is happening with the environment in the city is how I think of it in my brain. Um, it seems to be coming down to whether we had a neighborhood meeting or not on the topic. And I think that is beside the point. We have an environmental board that is supposed to be creating environmental policy. And unless it gets an understanding of whether what we are doing is allowing things to be harmed or providing for great improvement or doing both and achieving, we don't know, negative, positive effect, it's going to be really hard to make the city's environment better. And so what is provided for the data for the environmental George uh, board judgment is not what I experience in life. I see all kinds of projects that have happened, some with improvement, some with harm, some are in the middle, some are wildly out of date, and yet none of that is reflected in this report. And so I don't think that we are gaining um, what the environmental board needs to make good decisions by what was presented in this agenda. And the sewer plan, you know, that seems sort of like it's frittering around the edges, except for the fact that if we put everyone on sewer, then we're basically going to be flushing most of our water out of town. And, um, and that's not necessarily a good thing for our aquifer. It's not a bad thing to have a uh, properly functioning septic in our town. Thank you. I don't know how to mute either, but maybe you'll do that. Great, thank you, Connie. Um, we do have a number of other participants. Uh, Want to make sure no one else wanted to provide public comments. If you do want to, uh, please raise your hand or you can put a note in the chat. Not seeing any additional. Hearing no further comments, let's move on to our next topic. And Stephen, you're up. Stephen's going to give us an update on the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Um, for the record, Stephen Padua, the Long Range Planning Manager with Community Planning and Development, and here to talk comprehensive plan with you all. Um, the purpose of tonight is to talk about the new uh, element that we're going to be creating for the, the comprehensive plan, specifically around the natural environment. Some of, of this you heard back in April. Um, I'm just reviewing. A lot of it briefly, but also talk a little bit more of scope back when we talked in April. None of the new state, state legislation had passed yet, so there's a little bit new information about that. The issues or questions for discussion tonight is um, one, if the board would like to provide feedback on the title of the new element, happy to take that just so we have something to call it as we're working through it over the next couple of months and returning to you on. I believe September. 
The other discussion for tonight is just talking about the difference between the conference plan and other planning documents that we're going to be using uh, that's part of every board and staff's uh, work plans. And so that's part of tonight's discussion. So on the background, comprehensive plans were born out of the passing of the Growth Management Act back in 1990. The purpose of the Growth Management Act was to essentially have our communities plan for growth, address urban sprawl, as well as addressing our quality of life in all of our communities. The updates that we have for the conference plan, there's an optional annual update that uh, the city is has taken advantage of quite a bit uh, historically. And then there's the periodic updates that are actually required by the state to happen every eight years. Uh, we are currently in the periodic update. Um, so we are reviewing all the elements as required by the state. So all the elements that are being reviewed are listed on the screen. The two that are highlighted are two that are not required by the state for the cities as well as chosen to include as part of the conference plan as being an important topic to address as we are looking at growth for the future. And then with this new periodic update, we're introducing the new environmental related element that we're going to be working with the board on and trying to assemble. One of the things that I had talked about previously at the meeting in April is a lot of what's going to be going into this new element is a lot of the existing goals and policies you've already worked and developed as part of the development of the ICAP. And so what will be introduced new is, is some of the climate uh, vulnerability assessment work that your ongoing work that you're discussing with staff now, but also um, as I'll talk about later, some of the incorporating some of the feedback we got in April. So we have three primary goals with this period periodic update. The first being compliance, making sure that we comply with all new regulations from the state and the county, as well as any regional um, requirements that are there incorporating with anything that the county and the state is now requiring us to do. The bills that uh, we didn't really have at the time, or at least couldn't provide detail at the time in April are on the screen and and the, the most important bill that will be we're considering with the development of this new element is House Bill 1181. That's actually what's requiring cities to incorporate a new environment related bill that addresses um, vehicle miles travel, that addresses climate change and climate re uh, resiliency for communities. There's also some language about flood control and uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that need to be addressed. All components that we actually have with a lot of our existing goals and policies because that was developed well uh, with uh, the ICAP. And the, any, the pieces that were missing are actually being satisfied through the climate vulnerability assessment. So for the most part, what's now required of us, we're already going to be incorporating into the comprehensive plan. We're just now uh, assembling it into a new element. A big part of what we're trying to achieve with this periodic update is, is what we're calling the planning framework. And, and that's differentiating the conference plan being our 20 year vision from a lot of our working plans or functional plans is what we're calling them um, that are really more of the planning documents that contain a lot of the actions, um, more of the strategies, how we're achieving the city's vision. And that helps feed into a lot of the budget discussions, what resources we need as a city, and as well as a lot of the, uh, the direction we're trying to take as a city and as a community. And that'll feed into our performance metrics and then create this cycle of improvement and continuing monitoring of how we're doing as a community as well as as an organization. Uh, we bring this up because we, when we last went through the periodic update, we didn't have as many functional plans and that being the ICAP, we didn't have the mobility master plan, we didn't have the human services strategic plan or the parks strategic plan was kind of developed after a lot of that and updated after that. So we now have an opportunity to now put the comprehensive plan at a level where we can primarily focus on goals and policies in the comprehensive plan, where it's primarily a guiding document of how we achieve our vision. And then we can primarily work in a lot of our functional plans and our day-to-day -day activities and discussions of how we're really trying to achieve the vision. And a huge reason why we want to do this is one, we have the opportunity to use these functional plans and we have a lot more boards and commissions to have these discussions. We can now focus on implementation more so than having to always update 
this 20 year vision or comprehensive plan and go through the effort of updating it just so we get to what we're trying to do when we really should be focusing on implementation. And so that way we can be a lot more efficient with our time as well as the discussions we're having with all you all and how we're achieving a lot of our vision and goals. So we thought it would be helpful to provide an example. The goals and policies that I pulled from the comprehensive plan are also addressed in the ICAP. And the big difference between the two is you can think of the goals and policies as really being contained in the comprehensive plan elements. That's where our goals and policies should be located as required by the state, but also as a planning document. It makes the most sense within that visionary 20 year document. Then you have your actions from your climate action plan or the functional plans. These provide a, a lot more direction from the goals and policies that you, you shouldn't really see in that 20 year visionary document. Enough so uh, that it has enough detail that you can now identify strategies as well as resources to address how you're achieving the vision. When you're talking about the goals and policies, it's really not at a level where you can identify the resources or the specific strategies on how to achieve it. And it's really trying to give direction on how to achieve that vision. And then you get to the actions, then you can actually um, operationalize a lot of what you're trying to achieve. And that's really that dividing line between what goes in the comprehensive plan versus a lot of your function plans. And that's really what we're trying to get to the comprehend, comprehensive plan to the level of, so we're not having to continue and update that in order to achieve what we're really trying to implement. Before I move on, are there any questions? So I make sure I understand correctly. So the comprehensive plan is going to reference the ICAP in this example here. Is, is there anything that would limit the ICAP from being revised, modified um, by making that connection? If you wanted to modify the goals and policies, yeah, you would need to update the comprehensive plan too. But if you're wanting to change your strategy or where you're prioritizing your resources or even the actions, you only need to operate out of the ICAP itself. And so that's really what we're trying to get to is with that implementation, focus a lot of our efforts on getting the ICAP to where we want it, as well as where we're prioritizing our investments. Any other questions? Any questions online? I can't really see. So what we heard back in April, um, the topic areas that we pulled from the existing land use element, uh, which is what contained all the goals and policies from the ICAP, the suggestions were to maintain the natural environment preservation in this new element, to maintain climate change and how we're addressing it into this new element, and then with the climate vulnerability, incorporate more of the climate resiliency um, goals and policies that will be added now to that set of policies and goals. Um, the other feedback we heard from the board was we, we should be able to address what how the other elements are actually achieving some of this vision too. Um, some of the other elements do contain goals and policies that address climate change or uh, greenhouse gas emissions or reduction of vehicle miles traveled. So we want to be able to show that relationship within the new element and explain where they can find that. And so we'll be looking to do that with the new element. The other feedback we heard is we, we want to maintain a lot of those existing goals and policies in those other elements um, and not try to consolidate it into the new element because it just makes the most sense. Keep it in the topic area that's maintained. And it's, it's more effective when you're able to find a transportation related policy in the transportation element you know how it's achieving or trying to achieve the climate change goals that the city's established for itself. The other feedback we got from the board was establishing an ecological uh, lens to as we're reviewing the comprehensive plan for coordination across the different policies, but also as we're looking at how we're achieving um, the vision for the city, making sure that it's being addressed there as well and not just narrow to this new element. Yes, Joey. Um, I had a question about this. I didn't see included um, any feedback. When we were going through Title 18 and we were linking policy to code, uh, we found that specifically regarding um, bogs and peat, um, being able to have policy talked about 
how much infill was coming in, trips per site and things like that was a little um, more gray and we needed to be addressed at another time. Um, and when we talk about kind of our policies, being able to give birth to our code, I'm curious how that's going to be able to be folded in um, as in this kind of ecological lens. We know that there's a little bit of a, a gray area, a little bit of a hole in some of these things. Uh, and sometimes that's a good place for us to start talking about how we add policy in and if there had been a discussion from staff of kind of adding in some of those elements. We did talk about that um, through Title 18 or that the project to update Title 18. We, it's identified as one of the uh, uh, future update items for Title 18. And so that's actually something that we'll be addressing in the future. We decided it, it, it was too detailed of a level for policies to go into the comprehensive plan. Rather, it should be as part of one of the functional plans or the system plans that look at how to really achieve um, what was discussed with Title 18. It, it may be, um, behoove staff to look at um, how we kind of um, break apart and have subsections of our policy of being able to add a policy in that talks about and reinforces the importance of integrating that because right now it's kind of lacking from our policy and so it's kind of a jump step right now. Um, we know that there's a funding, we know that there's an end round that needs to happen prior and being able to kind of solidify that with a subsection and policy maybe. Okay. Go ahead. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just a little um, point of curiosity for me. So does the city use any traceability tools to make sure that uh, a uh, goal at the high level is implemented in an action somewhere at the lower level? You know, or policies in between? Uh, these are all connected. And there are tools out there that help you track that sort of thing. Is that something the city does? Historically, the city hasn't done that. But more recently, we've actually been driving more towards a data, uh, data-driven data decision-making process. And so with this periodic update, that's actually what we're trying to achieve, is being able to trace how a lot of the actions or what's going into the budget or what our work plans look like, how that traces back to the goals or even the vision for the city. And so with this new L that we're hoping to create a lot of those new relationships. It'll, from my experience, that's something that takes a lot of time to really perfect. So we won't get it done or perfect the first time, but it is something that we are actually working towards. Yeah, well, good. It's a valuable tool and it has to kind of get worked into the process so that when uh, weaknesses are found or whatever, you can use the, the uh, uh, the results of that tool to see, well, how does that ripple from here to there, et cetera, where, where did we miss something at all? That. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be supportive of uh, moving forward with that. Sounds like you're heading in that direction. Well, that'll help us get there. Any other questions? I might have one later. Okay. So the next topic for discussion is is the new element title and I wonder if we can get feedback on this and uh, what we heard from uh, the board at the April meeting was and you know a blank title of environment wasn't going to be suitable enough which fully understand so we wanted to throw out um, based on some of the language that we found in the comprehensive plan now what is, are, are we moving in the right direction? What language should we use? What should we not use? And again, we haven't decided on anything. This is primarily just getting in the next step of getting more feedback from the board. Um, can we comment? Um, yeah, the wor a word that I like is stewardship. So I would propose something like natural environment stewardship, but I don't remember exactly where that word has been used in some of the language uh, that, that motivated this whole, this whole process. Uh, but it, it captures well the idea. Well, it's not about just preserving the status quo. It's about uh, you know being a good steward to uh, make it uh, better if it needs to be better. And uh, it's, it's it's more um, uh, reflecting on what our role as humans is in this process uh, of being good stewards of the land. So that's that's my thought. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Of those, I like the third one, natural environment and climate resilience. Um, as I was looking at it, I also thought, hmm, should like uh, something about greenhouse gas reduction be in there as well? So, um, 
natural environment, climate resilience, and mitigation, maybe. Just, just like that. But, the, but Tom's word could be, it was stewardship, right? Uh, yeah, the issues of like uh, the environmental stewardship. greenhouse gas reduction. See, that's all part of being a good steward. Yeah. So it kind of catches those kind of things. So it could be environmental stewardship. I do I do think climate would be good to have in there. Climate resilience. Joy, do you have a content? Uh yeah, I have in brainstorming I um I do support and really enjoy the word stewardship. I think that that's a nice succinct way of doing it. Um I had amplify and preserve the natural world. Um, things like protecting the environment, um, environmental preservation, enhancing our natural world, um, and would be a proponent of um, maybe using more direct language that makes our sister cities used in this. I don't know that you need the word natural. I think it's implied. I think you can just say environmental or environment. Uh, I like the stewardship idea. I think that sounds really good. Yeah, environmental stewardship. Climate resilience, because the environmental stewardship is part of the mitigation, but the climate resilience is a step more where we're taking action to um, put up places for people to go when it's too hot, and, you know, emergency stuff, right? You said environmental stewardship, climate resilience. Oh, that sounds good. Are you looking for an exact title or I just that? we're looking for thoughts. We yeah. we you know we we knew what we we shouldn't be including from the April meeting. We wasn't sure if we were kind of hitting the mark with some of the suggestions. So this is actually really helpful. Any other thoughts? Okay. Time in the next step. So right now we're still in the analysis phase and engaging much of the boards and commissions about how best to approach some of the elements. Um, just as a, a brief reminder, a lot of the elements have already been updated in the last few years, and so much of the discussion about goals and policies is really going to be uh, focused on just minor changes to a lot of those elements, or for parks and economic development, more of development of their new plans as, as part of the comprehensive plan. And so some of these discussions are going to be a little more focused rather than the broader comprehensive plan. So when we have questions, it's more of addressing any of the issues that some of you might highlight in some of our discussions that we'll be having. Okay. Oh, and lastly, for a process, um, what you can expect, at least with this comprehensive plan, we're working with a lot, all the board's commissions and with their respective topics within, within the comprehensive plan to put together recommendations in terms of what's gonna be uh, changing within the comprehensive plan. All that will be going to the PPC or the Planning Policy Commission to review and who will ultimately make final recommendations to the City Council. Planning Policy Commission's review of the conference plan is actually a requirement of the state, which is why it's set up this way. But we are trying to make this as friendly as possible with each of the board's commissions to help uh, communicate any of those recommendations to Planning Policy as well through this process. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know. And then we discussed all this, so that actually concludes my presentation. Yes. I had a question that may be more detailed than you were looking for, but it's something that popped out at me. So, um, on the environmental impact with the new one, uh, there's housing and jobs, and I noticed that we're at like 104 percent of hitting the target, so we're beyond the target for housing. We're we're beyond the target for the year, oh, not okay. our total target. I see. And then for jobs, it was um, the, the target, we were like way off the target. And so I had a few questions about that. So what one thing is, is what does there was a, a chart where it said commercial um, takes one acre 
job capacity would be 89. Um, industrial takes 12.5 acres, and that would be 280 jobs. And mixed use is 244.3 acres and 20,738 jobs. So what is the mixed use? Is, I, I, is that the, what was read on a map that was farther down? So like um, stores, storefronts and stuff? Yeah, typically the mixed use is going to be um, you know, residential top with ground retail. Uh, sometimes it'll be ground retail, commercial middle and residential top. It really is, it's mainly just explaining it's the combination of different things uh, okay. or uses in, within the same building. So when you say, so I noticed it was just in a specific area. So when you say um, residential, so a lot of people are working from home now. And when um, the Growth Management Act was written, we weren't doing so much um, virtual commuting. Right. And that is, um, that's a big part of it. And I know that they talk about it at um, the UTC and stuff like that's that we want to promote that. And um, because there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built, you know, roads and um, just new lanes and off ramps and then buildings. So that's a lot of energy. So do we need, so how important is it? Do you feel a lot of pressure to, as a city, to hit those targets so that you can get grants or? Are you talking about the growth targets? So yeah. like the, the number of housing units? Yeah, it, it's primarily of just, that's us setting a goal. So um, one thing to consider is we have a building capacity analysis as part of the, the comprehensive plan. And, and the total capacity that we could do based on our zoning today could be a total of about 12,000 new housing units in the city. Our growth target for housing, we've set at 3,000 housing units by, well, it was by 2035, but it now be 2044. And all the other cities have set very similar housing targets to go for. It's not necessarily that says how much population will grow. It's primarily of saying this is what we're aiming for and encouraging for in terms of development coming into the city. And um, most of that is going to be primarily, or it's encouraged to be primarily in central school for much of the growth for now. So do you think it would help us um reach our climate goals if we encourage more telecommuting and virtual so giving people credit for working at home um, i didn't see that in the equation at all so there's a lot of people in issaquah that maybe we could be counting because they have home offices now they, they might and they used to go into the office in seattle or redmond or someplace else but now they're here in issaquah mm -hmm. so that might help us reach our target. It depends on the target we're talking about. <laughs> the jobs target. The, yeah. the jobs target potentially. The Both state. Targets. So the state is actually um, has been discussing how they evaluate the workforce because work from home has become a lot more prominent for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But some of that is shifting in the other direction mm -hmm. now. More recently, a lot of the larger corporations or businesses in the region have been shifting and ha having their uh, employees come into the office a lot more. And so a lot of people are still trying to monitor to see where this actually lands or what direction it might be heading. Is, is it going to be a split hybrid model for a lot of these businesses or is it going to be focused on um, promoting more of the work from home and, and what that means? And so that'll actually help us determine what our target should be. Because if we're looking at our, our commute trip reduction targets, We've exceeded that with all the work from home shift during the pandemic um, by a lot. But if we're just looking at greenhouse gas emissions, when people shifted from green, from working from home, other people shifted from transit to now driving their cars. And so now you have this complete shift in travel behavior for a lot of the communities in this and around this that is now changing how we are now gauging where a lot of the greenhouse gas, em gas emissions are coming from. And so people are now starting to come back to transit and people are now starting to go back to the office. Are we shifting back or is it going to be something in the middle that we're going to land on? Right. And like, well, we don't have any control over what other cities like Seattle does. Like 
I don't know if it was Seattle or somebody else who encouraged companies to ask people to come back to work. Um, as a city, we might be able to work with the businesses here to say, hey, we encourage you to help us reach our climate goals and encourage you to, um, if you want people to come back, then have the different businesses um, do it on different days so that it reduces the traffic. Mm -hmm. What they did in Seattle is terrible because now they just, traffic went real crazy again. So just some thoughts. Yeah, no, I think these are great thoughts and and all in our wheelhouse in terms of like what we could like to talk about. So just, if you have more thoughts like this, we'd love to talk about how we can best address some of the issues or uh, difference in issues now that the world has changed quite a bit since the last time we went through a periodic update. Do we need to look at different targets? So um, please send us more if you have some, uh, questions about these kind of things. So I, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, if you have any other follow-up questions, please let me know and you send me an email. Take me a call. Okay. Thank you, Steve. We'll be meeting with Steven several times over the next yes. few months. Uh, I am on the calendar to come back. All right, well, if there's nothing else, I will head out. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you. Okay, next up is uh, the National Environmental Checklist. It's our annual review of the checklist, and Christian's going to be walking us through this one. Welcome, Christian. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm Christian Getz. I'm the current planning manager, and this is the uh, annual check-in on the Natural Environment Environmental Checklist. Um, <clears throat> Since we met last year, there have been no projects that have required to have been required to complete the checklist, which is why I don't have a presentation to kind of run through of what are we talking about as, as far as who's who's come through, um, what uh, are there any conditions to kind of truth out the, the the checklist? As well, there aren't any projects that have been completed. So kind of those two benchmarks of new project in, gone through the check, you know, provided the information on the checklist and then the, the wrap up uh, phase. So really this is a, a an, an opportunity to run through the checklist with the, the changes that have happened since last year. Um, I'll pull up on the screen a version that has the track changes, which is a little bit easier to see than scrolling back and forth or kind of toggling back and forth between um, pages 42 and the, the pages prior, um, which might be good to kind of recognize what we added in there uh, to the checklist based on the comments, as well as the just general uh, cleanup based on the Title 18 uh, amendments. So we no longer do a neighborhood meeting and a community meeting. We merge that together into one um, pre-application community meeting wherein this checklist is going to be completed. Um, so why don't I pull that up at least to have for conversation purposes. Um, so really what I'm looking for tonight is any thoughts on what's been done to the checklist since the last time and any any input. So following what the uh, the duties and responsibilities of the environmental board uh, provide that feedback on the checklist and then see if there's anything else that could be added that would help identify and inform uh, policy, potential policy changes into the future, um, which obviously is tough with Title 18 just wrapping up, but uh, never a bad time to kind of run through, run through this. After we kind of run through this, I, I do want to chat about the spreadsheet, which was the, the final uh, attachment to this item. Um, but just kind of open it up right now to questions on the checklist as it stands today um, and see if there's any input there. Could you make it larger? Yeah, Christian, could you scroll it? Maybe yeah. Single page. <laughs> really hard to see. Um, and maybe maximize on your screen because we're seeing a couple different docs. 
No, I think when I PDF'd it, for some reason they disappeared. Uh, so that's what yes. Kristen's going to walk through. You have this document, but I don't think it showed the track changes, and no. you have the old one. For some reason, yeah. the track changes didn't remain in the PDF. Sure, sure. So some the, 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 the majority on the first page, I'll go through real quick. These these were just code the coda update um, edits. So there was there were no changes to the uh, you know the reasoning behind this uh, into the checklist. Uh, this initial section, these were changes based on on code updates, and then um, adding in sort of based on recommendations when there is a stream or a wetland. What is the buffer condition? Um, that's often, you know, it's something that we we often will get with, what we will always get with a, a write up. But in talking with the board last year, uh, what being able to take the current condition and then when the project is completed, did you go from a low functioning wetland and wetland buffer to a high functioning with all the mitigation that that occurred, uh, or was it currently a, a a rare but maybe well functioning moderate to, to high functioning uh, buffer. So kind of adding in some additional points that. Help with the 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 preliminary conversations. Um, were added in here. Um, additionally, just you know for shorelines is what's the current condition? Is it armored or is it natural? Um, just kind of. Triggering the, the conversation. Um, and highlighting those those items which will relate to the that spreadsheet later on and then this question number two was added has there been a peer review obviously if it's very early on in a project they may not have had a, a project a report that could be peer reviewed but if it had been um, we definitely would be able to provide some information, provide those materials at the pre-application community meeting, uh, which would be, I think, something the community would want. Sounded like it was something the board wanted last year, so we threw that in there. Um, and then on this page, a few additions, um, getting into a little bit more of the specifics on question two, does it propose to enhance include some values? So such as square footages of structures or improvements that are removed. Um, are you tearing down a building and removing it from a buffer? What uh, how big was it? What's being uh, improved there? And then getting into some some specifics on lighting. And then. I suppose question number five could could be expanded into question five and six with um, where their materials provided, um, but really looking at did they provide a, a a view corridor assessment with photo simulations of what the structures may look like? Um, did they start to at this very early stage begin to analyze if we're going to construct a building of certain size? Will there be any? any impacts to the, the scenic resources that are within that that immediacy or even a little further out. So it kind of depends on the scale of the of the structure. Um, so those were those are what we added based on last year's input. Um, and if there's anything you see there that you like, don't like. This is this is a good opportunity to kind of talk through it. Tom. Uh, so I have some comments about the general philosophy of uh, process improvement. Um, a process improvement mantra, plan, do, check, act. You know, this is textbook uh, process improvement uh, parlance. Uh, so uh, all right, this this uh, review right now by the environmental board is, is one of those sorts of things that could be categorized in the check. Um, a part of the process, but what I'd like to see here is built into the process with the participants of the projects, a post project review, sometimes called a lessons learned review. 
which uh, uh, looks over things at the end and says, well, okay, what went well? What didn't go well, both from an environmental perspective and a process perspective? And then that feedback uh, advises and causes updates uh, maybe to the process and uh, things are improved from there. So it's more close to the people who are actually involved in the project. So you get uh, you know good, good feedback, uh, uh, hopefully, from uh, that sort of thing. Now, the checklist, you could have a, an item at the end of the checklist, was there a post-project uh, review? But it, it shouldn't be the thing which causes it to happen. That should couple back to the procedure that it's related to. Um, so there, there would be some more wording, word somewhere at the higher level that says there shall be a post-project review. Uh, so that's uh, that's my comment. Great. John, Joy? Thank you, Don. It's nice to see you, Christian. Um, I am going to start with piggybacking a little bit on what Tom was saying. Um, from the perspective of the creation of this board, um, I recall PPC fighting very hard for there to be a regular review of this checklist so that the people who were closest to it were able to be able to adapt in a very real time to it. Um, I didn't quite get that from this now second or third touch of the checklist. And I think what it may be helpful to do is to think about, well, we haven't really don't have a lot of feedback on real world conditions, but we can simulate that. We can plug in projects that went well, that didn't go well, and be able to adapt it to that. Similar to the way that we kind of test out code ahead of time, we can be testing out our checklist, I think, in a way that gives us a little bit more feedback than we have right now um, without being too strenuous, I think, on um, on time constraints from staff. So I would like to see a little bit of a dive of thinking about um, how can we take a project that was successful and one that wasn't applying the checklist and seeing and simulating um, kind of an example of how we can get that feedback is interesting. Um, similar to my comments that I gave uh, Stephen, uh, we have, have identified that we have gaps in our code that need to be addressed. And for instance, things with um, bugs and peat, um, of being able to actually have a place in this checklist to be able to be addressed is absent and would, I would like to see it included. Um, I'd like to see language too that talks about the natural soil that's being removed being estimated um, and how much fill we're bringing in. Right now there's a detail that um, in site planning should be known but isn't necessarily covered in this checklist and I think it would be relevant. Um, I'd also like to see on page 43 a mention about compliance with our model lighting ordinance. Um, which is newly adapted. And so rather than just talking about um, uh, actually kind of going in real time, obviously there are different expectations and things we have in code about when um, developers are shutting down sites for the night, in fact, on neighborhood and things like that. But it would be nice to be able to see our new model lighting ordinance um, uh, reference, not just the, the critical air, the light to critical areas being referenced. Um, we also, a lot of the language talks about critical areas, which is pretty vital, but um, it kind of leaves out other areas that maybe we don't view as critical as being a it's a, uh, whatever happens. So I like an example here of um, well, where where is it estimated that water runoff is going to go on site? Right now we only have language that talks about it in a critical area. Is it being diverted to the critical area, which is important? I don't want to take that away. Um, however, I think it would be it's on the onus of the checklist to be able to say where are you expecting your water runoff is going to be going, even if it's not towards a critical area, so that every project is evaluating right um, what's happening. Um, ground infiltration, you know, is it going to a culvert, a roadway? Um, so I, I appreciated your comment about view corridor assessment. That's something that was um, needed, um, and I'm just hoping to expand the checklist to include. Um, not just our critical areas, but talking to about what are the expectations on site so that it's easier to identify, hey, this is um, not fulfilling what our expectation is and be able to catch it sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, I would echo both Joy and Tom's comments in that I think this needs to be ground proofed a little bit more. Um, I, I know you haven't had an opportunity to really run much projects through it over the last year, and that's unfortunate. And so if you have time or if you can figure out a way to do kind of a mock setup, that would be interesting. It might be a nice exercise. Sure. Yeah, one of the, and one of the, the, the tricky pieces about this checklist is that it is intended to be very, you know, to be managed at the at the very preliminary stages of a project um, to 
to in, to to press upon an applicant. These are the important factors to to consider in how you're designing your project and what you have to comply with. Uh, so it's, it it can take some time before they've gone through and and analyzed a lot of these things to know. Okay, how do I manage? Um, or how much fill or or you know in, import or removal uh, is needed. Um, and kind of segueing into the 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 spreadsheet intent, you know, by capturing these items and adjusting them as a project shifts. So the example in the packet had the Milano project. Well, that was its initial proposal with so many units. I think a 25% reduction, you know, that project has morphed over time. It's fewer units. It's I think a 17% buffer reduction and, and a few other changes. But as a project is completed, we can see internally what's happened. So we can, you know, as part of a, a reporting out back to you all, here's what the project was, you know, here's the change, you know, here's their their changes in the it, one way or the other of more uh, more buffer enhancements, less buffer enhancements, depending on what the code requires. Here's how they're in line with the code. And then that can help provide information to the board as well as assist in future uh, code update uh, processes if if needed, where we can say here's where here's where we're seeing um, improvement and here's where we're seeing room for improvement based on completed projects. Okay, one comment on the spreadsheet. I find it very hard to follow, so I'd consider reformatting it to something that's a little more. Yeah, it, it, it was it was more just um, a, a, a simplistic approach to, to tracking. Um, I've I've dealt with with tracking of of shoreline improvements, monitoring project after project over the course of 10 years and adding in even, you know, the every tree that's added, every, you know, overwater structure removed by square foot. And then after 10 years, you show here's how many acres of native vegetation we've installed. Here's how much overwater structures we've removed. Is that good enough or do we, you know, did we want to tweak that code a little more uh, to consider greater incentive, you know, are there are there carrots or sticks that we want to put towards that? So that was kind of the intent behind what will help staff have something to, you know, utilize to make sure we're, we're catching everything and then we have something to to come back to this board to to report out on. So. OK. Any other questions for Christian tonight? All right, thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You as well. All right, next up, we're going to hear about the sewer master plan update, and Matt is going to walk us through that. I think we also have Evan and uh, Julie online. All right. Go ahead and figure out a share real quick. There we go. Okay. Good evening. Matt Ellis, the Public Works Utility Engineering Manager. And tonight, yeah, we're talking about the sewer master plan, providing an update, and we're going to talk specifically about some of the policies that we're considering for the master plan. Uh, for a quick agenda, we're going to go through the timeline uh, from now until we adopt the plan, we'll go through a quick background about uh, where the plan began and, and how we've been developing it, give a quick overview of the master plan, and then the policies that we're considering. Uh, We'll go over very quickly the on-site septic system code revisions. We've talked, I've brought this before the environmental board back in way back in February, and then mobility and infrastructure committee. So we won't have anything necessarily new to present on that, but I will provide, since there's a few new uh, board members, we'll bring that up again. And then we'll talk about surcharge and capacity, pro capacity protocol, CIP development, and then fats, oils, and grease, fog policies. So uh, 
We are here in July and going to provide just the, the draft of the, the um, policies that we're discussing. Uh, in September, we'll be going to mobility and infrastructure again to talk about the consolidated master plan. Uh, then we'll be going to CEPA, uh, going for CEPA review uh, and code revisions, uh, putting in all the red line code. And then our hope is to get this through council in October and submit to the Department of Ecology in November for adoption by the end of the year. That's our goal. So a little bit of background. Uh, the city of the city's sewer master plan was last updated in 2002. We've grown from a town of 11,000 people to about uh, to nearly 40,000 residents, including mixed use, large commercial in a large commercial district. Large sections of the city were either built or incorporated since the last sewer master plan was developed. Uh, we were in desperate need to evaluate our system. One of the first steps in creating a new master plan was developing and calibrating our hydraulic model. Uh, this allowed us to determine how certain demands, uh, both current and future growth, impacted our system, as well as evaluating the effect of intrusion and infiltration, commonly known as I and I, as an system. This is where storm, surface, or groundwater unintentionally enters our sewer system. I and I has a major impact on sewer capacity and can create environmental concerns if a large con uh, connection is identified and creates costly downstream downstream treatment, which is managed by King County. Uh, all sewer systems have INI, and the goal is to effectively manage and reduce the amount of INI entering the sewer system. Uh, we, can note, we can't get rid of it all, but we can reduce it. Uh, work included in installing flow meters and identifying flows and calibrating and recalibrating the model. Finally, we set about identifying a model store that we felt our system should be able to handle. So here's our system. Uh, all the red lines are our sewer pipes. Uh, the gray is Snohomish Plateau Water District. So uh, we don't serve the entire city. Uh, a third of the city is served by Snohomish Plateau. Um, so we're focusing primarily on our system. Uh, at first, we provided our consultant with our GIS system and a series of record drawings to, so they could help calibrate our system. We then set about uh, um, utilizing recent determined water system demands from our water system master plan uh, uh, and then checking pipe slopes and evaluating estimated flow rates. This developed our dry weather conditions that we could evaluate compared to our dry weather flow meter data. Uh, this then helped calibrate our system. Uh, we made sure that the meters were in place for a series of storm events to see our system perform during this period. We had two relatively major storm events during the, uh, the period it was in, uh, up to the 10-year storm event, uh, and this supports our I, &I calibration. And then we made sure our flow meters were all uh, distributed uh, to be were located in every major basin uh, within the city, and. Uh, um, this helped provide the best calibration. And we used about 10 meters uh, for about six months. Uh, the final step was determining if surcharging was occurring during any of these uh, measured storm events uh, and comparing those storm events with a modeled storm that we felt the system should be, be able to handle. So again, this is our system um, based on uh, basin, flow basin. Uh, you can hardly see the blue is the pipes that we actually modeled. Um, and so we didn't do every pipe, just the major pipes and the ones that had the most amount of flow entering them. It would, be, it would have been too costly to model the entire system. Uh, we also evaluated. Uh, let's see. So I guess that's all I'm going to talk about for the calibration. We'll get back to that as we talk about some of the policy on that. Next step is about um, our policy topic. Matt, do you want questions as we go? Or do you yes, want please. No, you absolutely. The long presentation. So yes, go ahead. So you mentioned test storms. Yes. I was wondering, um, were those storms um, X amount larger than any storm we've ever had before? Or that's a good question. I will actually get back to that um, because we'll get into how we evaluated this the storm that our system should handle. Again, this is not our storm system. This is our sewer but we do unintentionally get storm water in there. And so it needs to be able to handle that storm. And so uh, when I get into that, I'll, I'll talk about this. So 
I should have done that second, the first part, but we're going backwards and we're going to talk about on-site septic systems. So that's our first policy topic. Uh, the second is maintaining sewer system capacity, which is inflow and infiltration capacity impacts, and then developer capacity impacts. And then finally, we'll talk about fats, oils, and grease. So on-site septic. Okay, so the on-site septic system code revisions and policy was brought before the environmental board in February. Uh, the first few slides is just a brief summary, like I said. Um, and why we, why did we update? Uh, it was a priority of council and the community, and we wanted to standardize the on-site septic management program. We have the responsibility to protect human health and the environment, and there's a TMDL, a total maximum daily load of fecal coliforms in Issaquah Creek that we needed to manage. Our goals is to protect the health and safety of the city of Issaquah residents, businesses, and visitors, to protect the environment and the quality of Issaquah lakes, streams, and groundwater, and to be responsible water, water stewards for future generations. So uh, we are updating uh, the, the, the municipal code chapter 13, uh, which is involving, uh, involving inspections, reporting, definitions, connection requirements, connection waivers, and enforcement. We were also formalizing an on-site septic system management program. Uh, and uh, this requires all septic systems within the city to be inspected by a licensed inspector to verify if a system is functioning correctly and make proactive improvements when necessary. We're also creating a stream monitoring program. Uh, this is due to the Department of Ecology implementing a uh, total maximum daily load for fecal coliforms on Issaquah Creek. Uh, the program is in place to complete stream sampling for fecal coliforms throughout the city, uh, and this is uh, a several year process uh, to complete the entire sampling. We have completed eight samples so far throughout the city uh, in 2022 and 2023. The locations were selected near unsewered neighborhoods. Uh, we have seen an exceedance of the fecal coliforms above the total maximum daily load on multiple occasions and at multiple locations. But we are still evaluating. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of contributing factors, and so we can't dial this down to just on-site septic systems. But it is a point that we need to, to consider and help, it helps us evaluate. Uh, here, go ahead. Um, I was curious uh, when we talk about this um, dichotomy, right, of, of aging septic systems and then being neighbor to so many communities that are in the greater Issaquah area that are um, built on hillsides and utilize septic systems, right? I'm thinking of Fairmont, things mm -hmm. like this, that will impact downstream at Issaquah Creek. How are we thinking about um, that connection specifically um, for neighboring communities and youth for impacting those are you, levels? Are you talking about upstream communities? Upstream, well, and then, I mean, basically surrounding communities. Right, we yeah. we're kind of all the way around. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that's been a bit of a challenge. So yeah. we, part of the sampling is sampling the upstream section, so we get a base point yeah. to make sure that we're not the just. We, we know we're not the only contributors, and it's not only septic systems. We're not. We can't put, point fingers at only the people who are septic. Some manage theirs perfectly well, and they're fine. A lot of people are live really far upstream, and so by the time there, if it is even in, in poor shape, by the time it gets to the creek, it's probably not doing an issue. So that's part of our thing is evaluating where these septic systems are located geographically in our city and then trying to figure out a policy for that. And that's kind of where we're going. Um, but we, we're, we're aware that there's other things. There's, there's farms, there's dog parks, there's homeless encampments that can also contribute to this. So this is just one piece in the puzzle that's why we have these centered around some of the, the neighborhoods that have on-site on -site septic systems to see if they are contributing. Um, it's not a thing that we'll be able to enforce with the uh, stream sampling. It's just a point to help us fine tune our research. Uh, we're, we are also getting better laboratory analysis to help distinguish human versus other uh, contributors. 
Um, but the main point is that there are a lot of beaches around here that are starting to close down because of uh, bacteria, bacteria in the streams. And so we want to make sure that we're being as good as stewards as we can. Um, and then, uh, so that brings up to the second point of connecting on-site septic systems to sewer within critical areas. That's our goal. Yeah. Yeah. Evan. Yeah, Evan. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to add to that uh, comment on how we partner with kind of our neighboring jurisdictions. So the all the the TMDL that Matt is talking about um, that is implemented uh, in ecology is implemented through our uh, stormwater permit that our city has. And through that, um, all our surrounding neighbors have that same NPDES permit and they have uh, various actions they need to be doing with that. And so um, our our actions are identified in what's called the Isquak Creek Basin Cleanup Plan or something like that. And so King County also is doing uh, screenings for in MS4 for um, uh, fecal coliforms and uh, E. coli and stuff like that. So um, and then we do have regional meetings with all our neighbors and everything on on all these kind of topics. So um, it's definitely something that we're always talking about. Um, and we have lots of regional partners that are in the same boat as us on that. Thank you. Just over the headwaters, which makes it a little challenging. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm a fan of data driven decisions, and uh, sounds like you don't have the data to show that these systems are contributing to the call form uh, uh, count. And yes and no. So we do have uh, data. And we have identified that we have far exceeded the TMDL of fecal coliforms around these neighborhoods. We know that there yeah, is well, a because there was a bear on the creek. Potentially, but that's why we are also adding uh, a feature laboratory analysis to distinguish between human and non-human. So that way we can actually make that determination. Yeah, well, it seems like you need that data before you decide on a policy change. Uh, that's, that's my view. Ah. Uh, and I guess, see, part of this, a, a, a well-operating uh, OSS is an environmentally sound system. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it might not be uh, well-functioning, but if it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a good system environmentally, and in some ways, it's a, a better environmental solution than pumping all of our sewage 20 miles to put a new south. Uh, that just seems crazy to me, and we continue to go down that path. Uh, but that, I mean, we're all, the whole region is, is bought into that solution. I, I'm not buying it, but I think someday we'll figure out that's a, that's a dumb solution. But anyway, that's the direction we're headed. Uh, so I, I look at, um, I think that the measures you're proposing here for uh, managing and inspecting uh, systems is, is a good idea. Um, but I'm not convinced that uh, septic systems, on-site septic systems, are inherently bad, no. which is part of what I'm getting out of this. No. They're, they're evil. We must get rid of them. No, and that's the one thing that we don't want to do is we're not forcing connections. We want to make sure that they are working correctly because one thing, we, after interviewing many people who are on septic, a lot of them aren't testing their systems. We want to make sure that they're at least testing to make sure that the systems are functioning correctly. If they are functioning perfectly well, we're happy with them, them continuing. But if a system is next to the creek where the, 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 it routinely floods or it has high groundwater, that's where we're, we're concerned. We're not concerned about the people who are up the hill who, who have great soils that are infiltrating. We're worried about the people who are right next to these critical areas. That's our, our biggest worry at the moment. Has the city evaluated any possibility of uh, treating treating the sewer effluent within our little domain instead of pumping it into Metro? I don't think we have the, the, the funds or capacity to do that. That's a good question. Or, or a location. Yeah, know, exactly. I know it's troublesome, but uh, this, just the whole system just seems wrong to me uh, for the way we manage uh, the sewage in the whole Seattle area but uh anyway that's that's a bigger a bigger issue than what we're talking about here, so yeah okay thank you yeah um so uh 
we did create the policy uh, or we proposed the policy and received concurrence from mobility infrastructure uh, that city would fund sewer extensions into critical uh, areas that are in our neighbors that are in critical areas. And that's rare. That's where we're, we're focusing our energy. Uh, the city would would fund that through the CIP and then property owners when their system uh, fails or desire or they desire to connect would then pay for their site sewer. So here are the, the code revisions that we're proposing. Uh, basically, we would want to revise the connect, uh, revise from connections, requ uh, require a connection required for parcels within, with structures, uh, I can't talk, <laughs> sorry. Revise from connections required for parcels with structures, sewer mains fronting their property to within 200 feet of their property. So basically, right now, uh, we're saying that if sewer is next to their property they would need to connect but now we're saying within 200 feet if their system isn't working properly uh, is that, that being your keyword isn't working properly you're not that's forcing right. people you're not in for, we're not forcing people it's only if their system is in failure i have a question clarification on that so is that 200 feet to uh, the public system or suppose suppose there is a private line system that uh, goes into the public system uh, that's uh, available within Boston Trail. Okay. That's a good question. I think we'd have to evaluate that on a case by case situation. Uh, a lot of these, there's a lot of top topographic challenges no matter what. So even if it is, let's say 100 feet, there's a creek in the way or there's a hillside in the way, it may not necessarily mean that you are forced to connect because of geographic constraints. And that's something that we are considering as well. You said if, um, if their system's not working properly, then they'll need to connect. Will they also be given the opportunity to fix their system? Yes, and that's the main thing we want. Um, again, if if you're if a property is in this critical area and sewer is available and their system doesn't work, then we want them to connect. But if they're up on the hill and they have other options, then yes. But like, what if they're in that critical area and the system can be fixed? Can they? fix their septic system instead of hooking up to sewer. Depends on what the failure is. So if it's like minor impacts to the septic box itself, then yeah, absolutely. If it's the whole drain field needs to be repaired, then no, that's where we would want them to be. Is this all defined somewhere? It, it will be. That's what that's the red line code that we're working on. Okay. At the moment. There's a lot of nuance on that mm -hmm. makes it challenging. Um, Again, we're going to require inspections um, based on King County Board of Health. That's three years, every three years for a gravity system and every year for a pumped system. Um, that's just in line with uh, recommendations from King County. Uh, currently, that's not being enforced and we want to make that enforced. And if a system is suspect of being in failure, uh, we want that verified through a die test just to make sure that there is no uh, dispute over if a system isn't working properly. We do that die test, make sure it is, and then that helps us, in, uh, informs us on what either a, a repair needs to occur or if it needs to be connected. Uh, violation, violation uh, repairs or replacement to septic systems are required as soon as possible. Um, failed septic systems will be reported to the King County Health Department. That currently is, a, is occurring. Um, they don't have any, uh, regulatory enforcement, um, but they do check up if a system isn't working properly. So uh, it's just to codify that. And then if a sewer is available, an existing failed septic system lies within a critical area, the property must connect to sewer. And then we did hear from M uh, mobility infrastructure on penalty. They want us to evaluate that a little further. This element we have not completely identified because it's a, it's a bit of a challenging subject and how do we enforce it? Or originally, we proposed not to enforce this through a penalized system, uh, and but we're still looking at that. So uh, here's the uh, extension program. We've created a sewer extension program, which we included in, uh, in the most recent capital improvement plan. This is a programmatic effect, uh, effort to extend sewers into unsewered neighborhoods that are within critical areas. Our goal is to provide sewer availability for all properties within these critical areas within a certain time frame. 
So in tier one is the 100 year floodplain, shoreline buffer boundary, and commercial and industrial properties. We want them to sewer to be available within 20 years. Again, it doesn't mean they're forced to connect only when their system isn't working. And then tier two is other stream buffers, wetland boundaries, and documented areas with high groundwater within 30 years. And then tier three is the critical area, critical aquifer recharge area within 40 years. Uh, historically, we've looked at private septic systems equally, uh, but uh, geographically speaking, our systems are not the same. And we need to look at this from more of the critical area standpoint. So here is tier one. Tier one is the purple line. And there are the pockets of septic that we're, uh, that we're looking at. Can you blow that up? I cannot. I don't want to think. Oh, I can. Oh, that's a new feature for me. I don't know if I can scroll down. I can. Okay. This is, this is exciting. <laughs> um, and again, some of these, this is just looking at it from a GIS standpoint. Some of these properties are, um, may not be able to be developed fully um, or may have other constraints. So this is the preliminary evaluation as we look at this. There, there's going to be more evaluation to make sure that these are, are in fact, able to be sewer to be extended and it is a viable uh, uh, option for them. Question for Alex. Yeah. I think you answered it, but I was just questioning. So these areas do not currently have sewer to them. That's correct. That's for there. It's going to be hard to see, but they're they're a different color. Like, so yeah. OK, like, the little yellow boxes. Well, the yeah, the yellow and boxes orange. are okay. in uh, the um, Samosh Plateau, orange are ours. Um, okay. So I just was, was trying to identify them with the circles is all I was doing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then here's tier two, the stream buffers. There's quite a bit more stream buffers. I didn't even do all the stream buffers because there's a lot of streams in Issaquah. Uh, and it, it blows up when you do this uh, by identifying the, those properties that have a stream buffer in them and have septic. But again, like I said, not all of these are realistic. Some of their their septic systems are outside of the stream buffers. This is just a, a quick evaluation to kind of show where those are at. And then here is the the current will be updated CARA for the uh, one to ten year infiltration system. So basically, um, fecal coliforms and other bile uh, uh, bacteria from septic systems can't get into the, the aquifer. We're not worried about that. What we're worried if, about here is just any emergent contaminants that may occur that we, we are proactive and uh, uh, making sure those septic systems are uh, have the ability to connect to sewer so they don't impact our aquifer with any weird chemicals. And there's only a few in there that we haven't addressed for the other two tiers. So again, that's the end of that segment. Um, and again, this was brought before uh, environmental board before. Uh, is there any other any questions regarding uh, on-site septic before I go on to the next subject? Um, considering how dense those areas are, are there like how many septics would you say there are? That's a good question. I know there's like 400 in the city and like 200 within these critical areas but some of them are small pockets and some of them aren't really this is again looking at it from a gis standpoint which means that they're not as accurate as like going out to the property and physically seeing is it really an issue or not so we're still evaluating some of this this is just to put it on the cat this the capital improvement plan so that way we can proactively uh, evaluate these these areas and make sure we have funding to, to do so. Did you say that the city would pay for the hookup? No, we would we would pay for the extension where it's appropriate to within you know beyond a barrier or to within 200 feet, and then the property owner would do the side sewer connection to that to that sewer line. So you'll give them 200 feet. Or or. I mean, if we're extending sewer, we'd probably make it to the property line. Okay. 
we make it reasonable. So that way they're all they're responsible for is the from their house to the to the line. Is to go out on and operate the the side tap from the main sewer line to the property line? No. Line? no. So uh, Connie had brought up the water levels, like we're taking the water away that it has normally been there because of the septics. Um, and I'm not sure how it would work because of how dense it is, but have you thought about like, and I've said this before, gray water, like promoting gray water and just have, you know. There's a lot of challenges. We, we will actually talk about gray water as part of our fog protocol, yeah, right. but that is, yeah. that is, I think it's more risky to do that. It's a lot more costly to uh, be treating and then infiltrating, separating your, your system, right? Your, your black water from your gray water, because then you basically have to have two systems in your, your house. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I looked into this years ago uh, on uh, um, repurposing that stuff. And it's, there's a reason why it's not in, in the Seattle area, just because it's, it's very expensive. I only have one comment on policy. I think while we're still here, it's on page 49, policy 2A. Um, right now, our language um, may require um, is what's used, um, and I would prefer more precise language for the growth accommodation requirement. Um, I'd like to have an accommodation for inflow to have heftier language for capacity improvements. Oh, so, we're, we're not to that policy. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm confused, but yes, we'll get to that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, with that, surcharging protocol. So, this is the second part of the of the uh, sewer master plan is evaluating our capacity. And uh, why is it an issue? Um, obviously, we don't want a picture like this. This is not in the city, if you were wondering. That's bad. Uh, we don't want sewer to be bubbling up into the sewer system. That's way worse than a septic system, right? Um, so we're, we're trying to reduce the amount of um, surcharge in the system. Surcharge just means the sewer goes above the pipe level and into the manholes, not bubbling out. That's the worst case scenario. Um, we uh, also didn't want it to back up in other people's properties or homes, uh, and we want to make sure uh, inflow and infiltration in our system was a measurable amount that our system could handle. Uh, finally, we need to reduce the amount of stormwater entering King County system as they treat it. We don't want to have them. We don't want them to treat more water than they need to. So. Uh, uh, one of our first orders of business was determining the size of storm event that our sewer system could handle, knowing some infiltration was going to occur in our system. King County uses 20, a 20-year 20 stor uh, storm event uh, as a calibration. We elected to do similar, and our design storm is between the 20 and 25-year uh, theoretical storm event, but it's based on an actual storm that we measured in February of 2022. Uh, and this is based on rage, rain gauge data. We felt using the actual storm as a useful metric to make sure our system could manage large storm events. So uh, here's an image of the storm event for a certain section of, of sewer pipe. Uh, gray is the normal diurnal use on, on that section of pipe, and this is an actual uh, measured flow that we saw. And then blue is the storm in question. As you can see, we observed a lot of storm uh, surface and or groundwater entering that particular uh, stretch of pipe. And, and this, by the way, is the worst case scenario. This is the worst spot in the city. Most of our city was great. This was not. We will be facing this. But it's a good example. Uh, this is the same section of pipe in profile. Blue is our pipe depth. Green is the ground surface, and red is surcharging uh, within those sewer, those manholes. Again, this is the worst case in the city, and it has been included in the CIP, but just wanted to kind of show it because it does really highlight what we're trying to deal with. 
So this all boils down uh, to a policy statement in maintaining our sewer system capacity. The city has two distinct geographic features that we need to worry about to account, as we account for this policy. We have the, the valley floor where we have sewer lines that are shallow and flat, and then we have mountain sides where sewer lines are on steeper grades and can be really deep. For this reason, we are proposing two different thresholds for investigating and upsizing or repairing pipe segments to improve capacity. Our plan is to include uh, segments of pipe that meet these thresholds in the CIP. As we evaluate, there is some terminology that we need to, that I need to clarify. Um, the hydraulic grade line, which is at the mass view, this line right here is the uh, depth of water within the segment of the pipe. It can be less than the diameter of the pipe, but it can also be higher if sewer is backing up into manholes. The hydraulic grade line is essentially evaluating the evaluation of the surcharging. And surcharging is measured as the height of water divided by the diameter. This gets really confusing, so I apologize. Uh, if a sewer pipe is two feet uh, wide and uh, sewage is backing up two feet above the crown of the pipe, so basically right here, that would be two divided by two, uh, four divided by two, which is two. That's the, the surcharge. If in the same pipe is only half the height of the pipe diameter, the surcharge would be 0.5. A pipe running full capacity has a surcharge value of one. Uh, freeboard is the depth of pipe minus any surcharging. Freeboard value of zero means the sewage is in, is spilling out of the top of the manhole. Uh, it can be the same. It can also be the same as the pipe depth if no flow is removing the pipe. For this policy, we are considering uh, two things. For shallow pipes, uh, we that is less than eight feet of freeboard. We are proposing in, in, in proposing to investigate or upsize pipes if surcharging is higher than the diameter of the pipe meaning sewer backs up into the manholes uh, above the type of top of the pipe during the design storm event. For deeper pipes greater than eight feet of freeboard, you're proposing to investigate or upsize pipes if surcharging is more than twice the diameter of the pipe, meaning that we allow sewer to back up into the manholes twice as high as the pipe diameter during the design storm event. Um, and this policy is based on evaluations of our new now calibrated sewer model. Matt, do you guys have monitoring equipment out in your sewer system? So, yeah, so we did. Smart manholes or anything to show when, when you're having surcharges? We did. We put it in for six months, and we are King County Metro, or I'm sorry, what well, was Metro? King County Sewer still has some in there, so they're still evaluating. Yeah. Um, but so the question for the board is uh, do you concur with our two pronged policy approach of um, basically, having two different thresholds, one for shallow pipes and one for deeper pipes. Yes. Yes, I can comment on your numbers. I mean, that was obviously engineered, but it's all complicated. I apologize <laughs> for that. But the, the concept is great. So, again, unfortunately, the CIP had to be developed before the master plan could be finalized. But based on the proposed policy, we evaluated our current demands and future growth scenarios in the city. The CIP correlates to this. Um, we need to assume a degraded, uh, degradation over time, meaning that our system will contribute more I and I in the future if the existing pipes and, and manholes in our system are not maintained. Uh, we are currently uh, using King County standard to 7% increase in I and I entering our sewer system every decade. Based on this, we had only one section of pipe that we added to the CIP for investigation remediation uh, and this is this pipe section is behind the fish hatchery on Newport Way and this uh, is the pipe segment that I showed earlier and it is already on the CIP. Uh, since it, and since it's on the CIP we've allocated funds and we are going to investigate and fix the issue. But that leads to our second policy question for you guys tonight. We want to make we want to make sure that under future scenarios that if a large development is uh, constructed, the corresponding pipe is evaluated and uh, upsized if need be by the developer. Developers are required to analyze the impacts of the development on the existing sewer system, uh, and if so, basically they would either model it or get for, we'd we'd be able to model model their uh, flow into the system 
and see if, if uh, uh, they need to contribute. And that's based off of this um, table here. So if a, a model pipe segment is, segment is subject to surcharging and developer, developer plans to connect to the pipe, uh, then financial uh, participation for improvements are proposed as shown. Uh, if surcharging is occurring and the plan development contributes less than 10% of the flow to the pipe, they are not responsible for upsizing the main. However, if, it, however, if they plan, the planned development contributes over 80% of the flow to the pipe uh, and it does create surcharging based off the previous policy, then they are responsible for 100% of the upgrades in the system. And we don't have explicit examples of this for the other cities, but this is a similar to our stormwater evaluation and improvements. We want to make sure that growth pays for growth and improvements to the city system is paid by the responsible parties and not rate, pay, right, rate payers if a significant contributor of waste is added to the system. So again, question from the board. Do you concur with our policy standpoint requiring developers to contribute uh, to uh, sewer upsizing if they add measurable amounts of waste to our system. Here, here. Yes, I do. Have you consulted with other cities around the area to see how they're doing this? I have not. We'll, we will evaluate. Will, you, will that be part of the process? Yes. So what's the size of development that would typically uh, kick things over that 10% threshold? If somebody was building a fourplex, for example, I I imagine it wouldn't either. It depends on the pipe size. So typically, these are pipes that are probably handling 100 or hundreds of, of uh, houses. Um, and so it would take something probably you know, more than 10 houses to kick it over that limit. It's, it's, it that depends point. where in the city it is. Right? Yeah. It's going to depend on the pipe. Our pipe system yeah. has been so patched together, we have different flow rates. And so as you start to see turnover and you start to see single homes changing over to triplexes and things like that, you're, it, it's totally going to be variable on where you are in the city. It's not going to, I don't think there's going to be an evaluation of unit because our, of how our pipes are. It, it depends if we get like a big commercial mixed use. Sure. Then, or, and we've got some, of, a few that are still coming in. It's, it's less and less now, but you know, right. lower as right. is, is still developing. So those are the areas that we're really concerned because again, that's the, the most growth is in the valley floor, which is the flat pipes scenario. And so we want them to be, we want to make sure that they contribute if they are creating need. So like in an old town, a popular thing that's been going on in recent years is to tear down a few houses and building a, you know, a six, six unit um, building or something like that. So that may or may not uh, trigger. That's correct. Those. And and that's why we wanted to have a, a stepped approach. So let's say if they contribute 10% uh, and it does create an issue, then they would need to help support our the, the pipe network to, to increase capacity uh, up to 20% of that, that project. Not the whole thing. But if again, if it's like a huge condo complex they put in 200 homes and they contribute 80 percent of the flow to that system and it isn't working correctly and they need to pay for 100 percent of it at least that's our proposal okay um so cip interface the cip again was adopted before completion of the master plan uh we identified critical areas to evaluate included uh, select sewer extensions based on past environmental board and mobility and infrastructure discussions and we included areas of high surcharge. So here's our uh, uh, CIP, CIP schedule for sewer uh, where we've interfaced with the uh, draft master plan. We have uh, one extension, the upper Sycamore extension, uh, Highlands lift station improvements um, which will help with the capacity uh, South Newport and Wildwood sewer remediation. That's the area where we saw the, the uh, uh, capacity issue. And then uh, we have uh, some infiltration and intrusion in the highlands that we'll be repairing as well. Okay. And with that, that's oils and grease. So as part of the sewer master plan, we also took a look 
at our FOG program. Uh, we identified two areas of concern that are currently not addressed in our city code, and this does not impact the CIP, but will have impact on businesses around town. Um, businesses contributing FOG to the city's sewer system should have appropriate grease interceptors based on best management practices in place. We found two gaps in our current code that we need to resolve. One, although all new establishments are required to install grease interceptors, a few existing restaurants in town are still operating without interceptors due to their longevity as a, at a single location or moving into a space where the previous tenant didn't have a suitable interceptor. We're proposing a retroactive clause for grease interceptor, interceptor installation. This would have a financial burden on a few existing establishments, requiring them to install a grease interceptor where one isn't currently installed. However, unreg unregulated fats, oil from grease entering the system have created blockages in the city's sewer system, which has created backup and problems for downtown downstream customers. A retroactive clause would be in, in alignment with neighboring jurisdictions. This has ranged between six months, one year, and as high as three years for businesses to get into compliance. This would require uh, existing business owners to actively manage outfall the sewer in line with other business establishments currently in the city. And uh, requiring a grease interceptor varies depending, greatly depending on the size and type of it that the interceptor is installed and amount of use projected. The cost can vary between $300 for a very small hydromechanical system to as much as $25,000 for a large fault system. That's typically for a very large manufacturing establishment. Uh, this depends on the amount of grease produced, producing fixtures. The size and price needs to be completed by a licensed mechanical engineer. Uh, work requires a plumbing permit. So all said and done, the cost for an interceptor and permit would most likely cost between $3,000 and $8,000 for a standard restaurant to get into compliance. So the question for the board on this one is, do you want a retro retroactive clause? And if so, what time frame should we use? Uh, uh, previous discussions that I've been involved with and had the opportunity to have with staff, um, I will say that I'm very glad for this move. Um, I think it's necessary for us to retrofit. And um, when we were evaluating the what we were estimating was going to be needed, we were estimating the businesses were going to be in around the $10,000 range and not that $25,000 range. Yep. Uh, and so I do think it's entirely appropriate um, to be able to, to have this change and gap in our code. Um, and right now, I would be a proponent of picking the, the lax option of one year um, to be able to allow for fiscal planning and giving, um, knowing that it only really applies to um, a few of our community members also. Um, and so kind of giving what I see as a more lenient choice of one year, I would I would back. We can go as far as five years. Um, being a business owner in the city is fun. Um, I, I agree this is a great thing to do. Um, however, the cost to run a business, business in the city is um, way more, and I'm not a restaurant, is um, a financial strain. And so I think um, one of the things that we should look at is this financial impact to existing business owners. Um, is The burden always seems to fall on small business. But the landlord makes a lot of money on the property. So my question would be is why why does it always fall to a small business owner? Um, and we're moving into a period of time where the burden on small business is probably going to be greater. This is not going to be the next next two or three to be a challenge. Um, have we thought about or looked at like where the cost really should lie? Like the landlord has been making money off that property for years and years and years and years and years. And a lot of times, I think people think business owners are making this amazing amount of money, but um, you know, we have very high um, minimum wage. There's a lot of things that affect small businesses. So um, I think it, to me, it makes more sense that that would fall on the landlord and not the business, because he benefits, he or she, sorry, benefits from that um, improvement for years to come. If the tenant leaves three years later, they pay for it and they get nothing for it. Exactly. So. Um, I think it's just something to consider, and it, it's still important, but I, I think we need to think about where the business, where the cost should lie. Specifically, what I've seen is these smaller units, the, the under $1,000 in-store units, if you will, 
um, are paid for by the business owner, but if it's built out in the parking lot as a vault or a, or a community shared unit, it's done by the property owner. I would echo that. Look, look for a way to, I've seen other communities use a, a mechanism of allowing them to pay this over time in their utility bill. So it's not an upfront hit. We also talked about grants that are being given by county and Olympia go to the business owner and not the landlord previously. And so when looking at um, ways that to be able to utilize um, current existing um, funds to be able to supplement and how things end up getting tracked, um, it seems to be the information that was it was easier to go to the business applicant rather than to the landlord for what it's worth. Which yeah, I mean, no, I, think, I just think we need to be thoughtful about I agree. it. You know, especially if we want our city to flourish. You know, small business, I believe, is part of every city. And, um, you know, I think it. we can all, we start to sometimes feel like, man, I know you guys want us here, but sure make it hard to be here. <laughs> you know, and so, like, I think how we approach that might be important, too, to the people that we're asking to do this, right? Like, you know, we want them to want to stay and be a part of the city. So, just my two cents. That's a good point. <laughs> And um, don't these get recycled often and turned into fuel? Sure. And do the business owners know about that? Is that is that still happening? So I know for a long time French fry oil was getting recycled and turned into fuel. Right. I think it's biofuel. Yeah, I think it's still happening. So is the are these quantities just too small or what? This isn't the. There's, it's not the. Grease directly from what you're thinking of, and that goes into a grease dispenser out back, a big bin that they dump it in. And then, yes, they recycle that to turn it into biofuel. These are contraptions that are built in line to the sewer system to capture any grease that gets washed down the drains before it gets into the sewer and coagulates inside there and causes a maintenance problem. Yeah, it's basically like an artery. Your pipes are your arteries, and they're slowly constricted because there's, there's Stuff that you want, yeah, you wash down the drain. Do you know that people, so it seems like this is from washing things. So are there people in Issaquah that do recycle their grease oil and fats? I, I don't know that. Uh, Evan and, or Julie, are you online? Do you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, so it's not a... Um, it's I think the technical term is brown grease, and that's not something that is done. I think there is a, a like a treatment plant in California that kind of looks into that, but that's not a um, I, th I don't think there isn't really an industry for that uh, right now. For, for as far as uh, grease from a grease trap, but yeah, like like Don mentioned, uh, fat, uh, gree, um, fryer oil and that kind of stuff, 100%, that's being used and, and recycled. Uh, but these are, are more of just a waste product. Cool, thanks. Sorry. To that point, I believe that Issaquah doesn't have any drop-off locations. Right now, King County does, but Issaquah does not. And so when we talk about um, how we create um, easier avenues for people in Issaquah, um, the same way that I would advocate for there being um, not all communities have compost service as well. And so being able to have whether it's a weekly or a monthly sponsored program to be able to have people come and drop off um, grease to be able to drop off compost, I think is a really interesting thing for us to explore um, as things to be able to, and resources to bring to cities to our city for residents who don't have that necessarily available to them to their with their current you know garbage plant included. All right. All right. The last part is uh, in the second code revision require mobile food vendors and food and beverage establishments, including food trucks and freestanding coffee stands to develop and submit a gray water management plan. The nature of these businesses means that they most often operate without a sewer subject to mention. If not managed property, uh, properly, gray water or other waste streams can discharge the stormwater system and or surface waters. We want to require similar responsibility as brick and mortar establishments, including a fillable form describing where they plan to discharge gray water. And we've not developed that form yet. This could include either discharge into a dump station uh, within a brick and mortar establishment uh, or renting a portable grease interceptor and discharge into sewer. 
Uh, similar, to, this would be similar to the fog log that we require for brick and mortar establishments. Uh, we hope to create a mobile uh, vendor gray water management plan and website to provide education and outreach. Uh, the, the city has responded to multiple examples of this kind of illicit discharges, and this has historically used education and outreach as the first approach. But unfortunately, the edu education and outreach is typically reactionary if we see an issue. We want something that is more enforceable for these vendors and proactive to provide uh, resources up front. So again, question for the board. Uh, this effort will require staff time and resources, but ultimately will be proactive in preventing illicit discharges, which takes place uh, time and resources to respond to. Do you, agree, do you agree with the approach? We're asking, we're also looking into ways to automate this information and make it available at, uh, at the time of a permit issuance for a mobile vendor. What's in the gray water that's causing problems? Well, we just, suds and soap and other debris going into our storm system so again if it goes to the sewer that's great but this is actually the reverse where we don't want the stuff in our streams um so we don't want any of that stuff it's, it's, that's real bad for yeah i used to deliver mail up um, on the plateau and i would often see like people putting paint you know there'd be like white paint or paint running in and then there's the runoff from the chem lawns. You ever see that? We need to know about that. That's, that's <laughs> <not good. laughs> Actually, Evan and Julie manage that uh, NPDES system, so it or, you know reports bill. So we we need to know that kind of stuff. That's oh. that's no good. Yeah, guess I should have reported it. That's so okay. It happens a lot. It does. It does happen. Um, so I'm just thinking, like our suds, like what's worse, paint. Or suds like where what's more important are the chemicals that run off of the lawn? Well, um, they're all bad. I think we're just trying to manage as much as we can. Are all this discharges and treated as pollution spills and illegal dumping? I would ask that you not get ahead of yourself on this and develop a Issaquah specific plan, but rather work with the region. There's probably two or three region wide studies going on right now, specifically around mobile vendors and dumping of their gray water into the storm systems. And um, those are going on through the stormwater action monitoring group. Evan knows how to get you in touch with those folks. Great. Um, or you can send me an email, I'll get you in the right spot. Um, but research that before you go down the path of, of building your own, because a regional approach is much more, uh, it can be a lot more powerful because these trucks move around all the time. Yes. They're not in Issaquah every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I highly support the language for further oversight um, and specifically referring to the further code needed to manage the gray water discharge. Um, when we created the current um, and most updated um, code, we are trying to make a more inclusive place and an easier access for food trucks to come into Issaquah. Having said, we also want to know who is here and for how long they're here. And we need to have a metrics of understanding um, what's happening and making not only a friendlier place for it, but more visibility and oversight. And so being able to have a better understanding um, for also our vendors coming in about what is expect expected of them is really vitally important as we expand this industry. Exactly, and that's a 100% agree with that. We're, we're, our hope is that this wouldn't be a one-off thing. This would be, if you're a vendor, you want to come into the city, you apply for your permit, and this is part of that package. And it's a one every year you'd apply for it, basically. So it's just a reminder. Hey, have a plan in place. Tell us where you're going to discharge this stuff as part of the permit. It's not a thing that we, we pester them every time they come into the city. It's just a way that we have actionable items to monitor them and make sure that they they're cognitively aware that they shouldn't be just dumping it straight into the stream or into a storm drain. Is there any um, data of, I mean, it's probably a hard number to get, but like, like where they're dumping or? No, and that's a, that's a tough one. Unless we get reports about it, then we, we can get data, but otherwise. Is it assumed that a lot of times they're just opening it up and not letting it go? <laughs> and, and finding a short really. 
You know what I mean? Like, especially if you're coming into a neighborhood and you're leaving, that you're just looking around and it's. Yeah. I've seen it numerous times. Yeah. It's end of day when, when they're getting ready to shut down, they just pull the plug, let it drop right in the store. But if it's going in the storm drain, it goes directly to the stream. Oh, okay. No treatment whatsoever. Okay, that's from. Um, I'll also add, you know, sorry, um, we have had lots of conversations with a lot of these mobile business vendors um, in times when they've had uh, issues, but then also just going in and having conversations with them through our pollution prevention program. And a lot of them are having it pumped out and hauled out through. I mean, the, the grease trap vendors that come, they can they pump out their tanks as well. A lot of these trucks have tanks on them. And uh, they they are hauling that off and and getting that taken care of. An another place where we always recommend people is uh, the RV uh, dump in Issaquah. We we recommend you know going right there is a, is a place to do it as well. So there are plenty of trucks that that are doing it. We just uh, yeah we're just trying to have that documented. So again for like that knowledge base to make sure that everyone is aware of uh areas where, where you can be doing it and then that, that they're doing the right thing too so I, I guess just one thing to add i think um human beings operate better when they're um, rewarded not punished and so maybe another thing to think about as we're thinking about this mobile vendor is rewarding them for for doing the right thing right because it's probably very tempting to do the wrong thing it's pretty easy so maybe if there's some sort of advantage to you know, if they're like, I don't know, maybe the RV park has a cost. I don't think it does, though. I think it's just a ton. But, but maybe there's a, you know, hey, it's free if you do it here. Or or maybe you get a, you know, if you if you can prove that you've dumped it, maybe you get a, a reduction in your permit cost. Or, you know, business owners love that kind of stuff. So um, I think if we can reward them for the right thing, they're more likely to cooperate. And the cost is probably much um lower if they if they cooperate than us creating all these systems when we can just say hey just do the right thing and you know we'll give you this just a thought i love it uh so i know for stacy because the mobile rv park is um currently a piece of land that's moving and is in flux and um the accommodations for it and all the different discussions that we had around um around that uh, this never came up and so hearing it as this is a resource for our community um if you could kind of put a pin in this and remember as things are fluctuating and um that uh that uh, that accommodation will be reduced greatly um and so allowing and saying how are we using that space and making sure that it mirrors um as it's moved is very uh, very thoughtfully is Well, that is it. This is just a recap of the policies that we discussed, but I think we I got the information I needed. Uh, any further discussion? I don't have anything to Oh, just Do we want to deliver? Story. So, a uh, question from the board. Do we want to, are we comfortable with Matt taking the notes that we've, we've told him verbally and allowing him to go there? Do we want to form a memo public to him for consideration? I can summarize some of it. Key points I heard on the policy too. You're going to be, this is going to come back to us, right? Um, I don't think so, unless you guys are feeling like you want any elements to be rehashed and discussed again. We'll see storm water, we'll see surface water, but we shouldn't see this again. Yeah, yeah surface water has actually been adopted. So that, the oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the last of the month of the master plans. I would I would suggest we just leave it as is and allow Matt to have our notes that mm -hmm. Stacy puts together and reflect it in there. Unless everybody anybody wants a formal memo, and then I'll let Stacy do that. So, yeah. well, I really appreciate you guys' time. Thank, Thank you, Matt. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That Stacy, you got any reports or schedule updates? Yep, us? just really briefly. Um, one uh, event plague for you, and then just wanted to mention a couple of the upcoming items for our agenda. 
Um, July 24th, you should have received an invitation as well as a reminder, is our lead for city certification celebration luncheon. Um, there'll be lunch, we'll do a brief program with talks, and then there'll be a tour of a salmon restoration site near Pickering Barn. Um, so we'd love to see all, most of you there, if you're able to come. Um, we'll also be doing an event with council that evening, and then we'll be doing some events for the public the following day. So if you're not able to make it for the luncheon, um, David and I will be at the resource fair in front of the community center on that Tuesday, the 25th, um, displaying the posters around the lead certification. There's also the chalk art festival that day, and then there's a concert uh, that evening. So we'll be there um, to interact with the public and, and showcase and celebrate the lead certification. Um, and to see board members um, at any or all of those events. Um, we have a pretty heavy uh, agendas for the next couple of months as we start to really dig deep into the comprehensive plan. So we'll be taking a lot of what we um, heard from Stephen, discussed with Stephen today, and then starting to move into reviewing uh, some of those new components for the new environment element or whatever we decide to name it. Um, so that'll be a major focus over the next couple of months. Um, and then we also have a couple of decision items that will be coming forward. Um, I believe we'll have the municipal decarbonization resolution um, for you all to review next month. And that's uh, committing the city to essentially look, do a decarbonization study for all of our buildings. We'll be looking for feedback and approval of that. Um, we'll be having the sustainable purchasing policy coming within the next couple of months, which will be another action item. Um, next month, uh, per the request of the board, we'll also hear from our communications team. Um, have an opportunity for you all to meet them, hear what they do. Um, but then there was also interest in hearing a little bit more about the public engagement toolkit. So Thomas will be here to present that. So a lot on our plate for the next few months, but some exciting action items and digging into setting vision for the city. Thank you. Yeah. Any announcements or new business <coughs> from the board members? Hearing okay, none, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Sure. Thank you. Really great work, Matt. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you, Matt. Oh, thank you, guys.